Welcome to the WT FFF Special Series, brought to you by the Z and 3D print teams from HP, where your hosts, Tom and Tracy Hazard, explore the all about the what of 3D workflows from concept to print. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of WTFFF, sponsored by HP. I'm Tom Hazard, along with my co-host Tracy Hazard. And today we've got a great interview with David Hollins. And Tracy, uh, we already had this interview. Obviously, we're introducing him now. And um, I was really impressed. It was much better than I expected it to be. <laughs> Wait, because we're going to talk about school? Well, like, so you thought it was going to be boring? I, no. no, we're talking was, 3D print education. We're yeah. continuing this sort of education and STEAM topics that we've been talking about for a couple of episodes because we're trying to we're trying to group these in, in, in groups of things that we can talk about. So we talked a lot of foundational things with megatrends and sustainability before, and now we've got the educational segments that we're talking about now. So laying the groundwork then as we move into manufacturing and some and design and all of the other things that we got going on so in this great series so you thought education mm, gonna be boring well it wasn't that you know reading all the information all the bio I'm like I was really struggling a little bit for where is the 3d printing tie-in but you know what it kept presenting itself over and over, over again. And over. Right, yeah. exactly. So let's let's give David a little bit of background and information on him. So David Hollins is the Education Industry Strategy Manager for Asia, Asia Pacific and Japan for HP. He oversees HP's education strategy in that region, and he works with HP's country teams, governments, leaders, educators to drive the development of initiatives, policy, and research on emerging technology to further educational development. So things like 3D printing, furthering education. And with the aim of helping to realize HP's big broad goal of improving learning outcomes for 100 million by 2025, 100 million students having an improved learning outcome, that's fantastic. David has a passionate commitment to helping education as his life's calling and sees himself as a volunteer um, by spending his time across many different education initiatives, projects, and communities across the region. He serves as a thought leader and industry advisor, including acting as an industry advisor for the National Digital Technology Curriculum for the Australian government. And today he's joining us from Perth, Australia. So we're, we're talking around the world tonight thankful for technology, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I'm really glad that we're doing this because we do need to tie in sort of an understanding of where we've been going with this education piece and see like the bigger, broader education and how can 3D printing and STEAM education and 3D print education in general improve and come to making better workforce, better humans, a better community, you know, all of that together, right? And better design and all those other things that we've been driving for all along here. So. It's actually really exciting stuff. So let's go to the interview with David, and then we'll be back for a few thoughts after that. Well, David, thank you so much for joining us on WTFFF. It's great to have you on the show. Pleasure to be here. We're very interested to talk about really some deeper things regarding education and get your perspective as to how that applies to, you know, 3D printing and, and perhaps higher education, obviously. Well, you know, I mean, if we talk about education here is it's not just like, let's teach you how to 3D print, right? It's 3D print education means we got to have a lot of broader talk about manufacturing and engineering and, and like there's just whole components about it. So it does seem to be like a higher education conversation but I think we should start a little bit lower and prep first. Like, what do you see as like the critical factors in prepping up so that we really can get the great workers coming out of our higher education with the skill sets that we need? Yeah, that's a that's a, a great way to start, isn't it? Um, so how do we get ready for higher education? And so we can think about building a foundation of understanding um, and it's interesting, but when we get into something like technology, it's probably preparing our minds uh, and perhaps our hearts for the purposes for technology. So they play an incredible role in um, engaging us in meaningful work and also in the kinds of work and the kinds of skills that we're looking for. So we hear a lot about 21st century skills and we might call them, uh, or they're often called soft skills. And so these are, these are things that universally allow us to adapt to environments, to different communities of people we might be working with in a really flexible way. So the emphasis right now is actually on how do we develop those 
critical thinking, uh, collaboration, uh, communication skills. So believe it or not, apart from just being exposed to the sorts of technology opportunities, things like 3D printing at those sort of grade school levels, it's about imparting some of those skills early so that once we reach a point where we're really doing you know, engagement with uh, real world problems at university or higher education, um, that we're equipped to work with people, communicate our ideas and adapt and change as new technologies and I guess, you know, um, disruption occurs. Well, you know, that's bringing me to the point is that we're recording this um, during the time of COVID and we've been mentioning it a few times already in the episode. So we're mentioning this while many people are sequestered. You're around the world in Perth and, you know, and we're yeah. out here in California and, you know, our kids are not in school yeah. and in our universities, we were just having a big discussion here about whether or not some of the universities in California were going to have students back. And we were thrilled to hear some more because you don't get those great communications and collaboration skills when you're sitting alone at home. It's not quite the same. And that's a, you know, an unfortunate side effect that we may have is like this little residual bump of, of difficulty in finding good people as we move forward to hiring who have great skills because they missed out. Yeah, that's true. Um, and I think the situation we're in, and it's so hard not to talk about it, apart from the negatives around, you know, kids learning, uh, you know, being disrupted, if we think about the opportunities of STEM, where we are right now, we've seen some amazing examples of that that touch on the use of 3D. So we've seen grade school uh, kids all over the world participate in uh, helping to create um, sort of the medical apparatus, you know, things like mask uh, holders and things like that using domestic 3D printers. Now, what's really amazing and great about that is that uh, when we give learners the opportunity to um, develop their education understanding on something that matters to them, uh, unsurprisingly, they accelerate their educational sort of outcomes. And so uh, it, it, it's almost you know, a no-brainer to say uh, if we took an adult who has no reason to study, you know, it's the three of us, <laughs> and said, well, I'd like you to learn, uh, go back and do algebra, I'm going to have a hard time convincing you to study that for the next six months, aren't I? For no you, reason. You've I, already I been having a, might. yeah, <laughs> you, we've already been having this discussion about many of us parents who actually feel like we're going back to algebra and on fractions and all of those things that we no longer have to do manually anymore as we're sure. helping our kids at this time. <laughs> yeah. And it's so, not fun. So just, yeah, exactly. So, so think about the fact that these students can, uh, are engaging in design they're thinking about and if we offer them the opportunity to because they certainly do care about the challenge that's out there in the world but if we offer them the opportunity to do project-based learning and look at ways in which we can uh, make that immersive for them and 3d print is an immersive technology for those that have access this is a really um, big opportunity for them to ground the reason for learning in something very meaningful well and that's so the that's, big question right there um, that you're pointing out yeah. though the access is an issue because it's an economic it issue right and and it's a you know wi-fi and and bandwidth issue like so you have all of that going on right now too so that's cumbersome and problematic for a lot of families and um that's an unfortunate as like as we're talking about that prep level we really are mm. going to have to do a better job to compensate for that yeah, true. And, and, and look, access is about, firstly, being a part of the digital world. And so we know um, at a sort of a, a worldwide level, there's a big, big challenge in terms of that access to digital. And we know that's a huge uh, game changer for opportunities in our lives. So then when we take an extension like 3D printing as a technology, um, we know that this deepens the digital divide. So if we start to talk about the trajectory of 3D printing and, and uh, the fourth industrial revolution, well, we really want to, as we're considering its place in education, ensure that we can give access to everyone who's uh, you know, a student. And, and so there's this amazing opportunity to democratize manufacture, for example, which is 
are incredible for developing countries and communities who whose traditional crafts and um, trades have been challenged you know globally through manufacture and mass manufacture um, how do we give them back you know that opportunity for their families and communities and 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 so we're sitting in a, an incredible opportunity to do that but we do need to think about okay well how do we build um, the education capabilities that empower that and, and that's in developing countries but we know this is a big problem actually still in developed countries uh, like the US like Australia <laughs> Um, there's still gaps, right? There's so, still a lot of gaps. Well, you know, you so you've been working with leaders and industry advisor. You work with the administrators. You work with, you know, the bigger groups and broader in looking at education from different standpoints. And there's nothing that's more, I'm going to say, bureaucratic and, and complex than trying to navigate the university system or our school districts. And I say that from personal experience, right? So how do you start that conversation with them about how, about, how they can improve their initiatives, how we can really improve the learning outcomes as well, because that, you know, that's really important. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a, a great question. And I think it comes down to um, depending on who we're talking to, what matters to their country, what matters to their city, their, um, their community, what, what is of the greatest importance to them? And then thinking about the implications for that longer term and then tying whatever I'm going to talk about in terms of educational development to the technology that's best going to help them negotiate those, those issues. So again, tying it to 3D printing, I was in India last year and I was talking with the All India Council for uh, Technical Education. So that's their big body for governing all of the technical education in India. So they regulate the curriculum for uh, engineering, science, all of those disciplines. And uh, when I was talking to them, they have, one of their challenges is they have these institutions all over India uh, that are being underutilized to some extent. And they have this enormous challenge with youth unemployment in India. So they have this resource which is aimed at helping that and they're doing an incredible job despite the logistical issues. But, you know, what I was able to talk about there was the opportunity for India's future in terms of democratizing manufacture and talking about 3D printing, for example, in that context, I was quickly able to sort of show them, look, just imagine a community that can participate in global manufacture in the ideas industry through design through you know these centers that you already have and this is great for them because not only does it mean that there's this economic opportunity that which could grow at a very grassroots remote level but also as we know uh, people like the three of us um, you know 3d printing already does a, an amazing job at medical devices and interventions right so you can imagine that having some 3d capabilities means that those outside of your community if you're connected to them can actually create things at your location not necessarily needing to be there so that means we could have you know prosthetic technology being delivered into those communities with the medical experts actually located in another country so it's about saying if we have this opportunity, this could be the future for those remote communities in India, of which there are many. And that, that's one, you know, a, a really cool example of a recent conversation I had. And, you know, it was really encouraging to see how 3D could be put into that conversation. So remember, it's not, it wasn't about, hey, let's rejig your additive manufacturing future in India in the sense that we're going to help your industries transform absolutely having that it's like conversation supplementing as well. and and bringing that supplementing yeah. in to grow the industries that they already have and the needs sure. that they already have that's a really interesting way to look at it and i understand that hp has a goal of improving learning outcomes for a 100 million by 2025 tell us a little bit yeah. about that cuz that that's a big goal and i i mean i'm i'm sure. glad that they have that goal but i'd love to hear what that's <clears throat> what that means oh sure yeah so so for us um, i guess our our mission at HP is to make life better for everyone everywhere. So it sort of, you know, grounds us in how we are trying to develop our technologies um, to improve life. So sustainability, you'll notice is, I mean, it has been since our founding, entrenched in 
kind of how we do things. So from an education perspective, if we think about how we really truly transform the world, what is the basis of that? So if we go and do something in a country and we help their education, we empower the, that future generation to have more opportunity, fairer opportunities, um, and we address a whole bunch of issues that the world faces before they happen. So it seemed obvious to us and it has that that we could do something there. So for, for that goal, which is, as you say, not a small goal, really also pushes folk like myself who are in the education team and our whole company to look at ways in which we collaborate. We play a role as a technology industry to help do what we can to provide our expertise, um, to share our vision of the future um, with, with education. And along the way, education has unique challenges. Um, so we talked before about access. So the first thing that we've got to do in order to hit that scale, and that's what it's about. So how do we how do we do scale in education? And it's about exploring the challenges, as I said, in a nation, in a community that really are impacting them. And then f from our perspective, trying to pull together the stakeholders so we can do something which has a huge impact. So I'll give you an example, one that I'm quite proud of, but in China, for example, the last couple of years, we worked with the Ministry of Education there to actually look at their math curriculum for middle school. And we began the call about how do we create this on-ramp? And so we actually did research with um, their sort of universities around, you know, is, is the way in which we teach just something like math, um, really helping kids to develop those soft skills and apply it to real world situations. And it turns out we could do a lot better. So we worked with uh, the Ministry of Education on that research. And right now they're, they're kids learning math, 40, 45 million, uh, I think in middle school in China, uh, are now doing it around investigation. So instead of, you know, like the three of us probably sat there with a maths book, you know, so when you're 15, <laughs> What they have is they have these environments. So we, we looked at their environment. We looked at what they were learning and how they were learning. Now they're doing it in an investigative way. So helping like to embed that. Sounds in integrated arts um, or integrated you math mean, program. Yeah. yeah so our daughter went program. to an art high school, our oldest daughter, an art high school, and they had that. And like everything was a word problem and everything was an exploration. And it, and it reminded me of some of the things we did when we would get to like higher math when you started to get into calculus. But it was sure. so early on and it was such a different approach and a more uh, creative approach, I thought, to math. Um, it was fabulous. And then they, have, then they did away with the program, but it sure. was fantastic. But that sounds like this is kind of similar. Yeah. So imagine, you know, HP getting involved in helping a math curriculum for the largest uh, country on earth. So that's where we, I mean... And why, why math? I mean, but here's the interesting thing. HP invented the scientific calculator. So there's <laughs> there definitely a reason for that, right? <laughs> yeah. so, so, and we still make them. Uh, but it, it is about trying to look at this from a, from a really big scale perspective. And that's, you know, coming back to technologies like 3D printing, how we really like to encourage education around that is to really try to, to run alongside industry so that we can push the bounds of scale and speed. Those are the two things that we really need for the 3D industry to take off. Um, even if you're at home, you, you just pray for the day that your um, 3D printer will, will churn out multiple models in a few minutes. That'd be wonderful. Um, right? We so, pray, so, yes, I mean, every then, day. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, but, but hey, let's not forget there can be a Zen-like experience sort of uh, watching the model being built. <laughs> I don't know what's... <laughs> it has kept our kids busy be. for some time. <laughs> sure, sure. It's like, it's like gardening. It could be quite therapeutic. <laughs> Maybe we don't want the printers to, uh, you know, uh, go the way of incredible speed, but it, it is, it is super important. So how do we, you know, education is a problem at scale. So a hundred million is the goal. And this will force us into a position where, uh, we're coming up with solutions with communities, with governments, with institutions that have the promise of scale and hopefully deliver <laughs> because if we can do that, it, it, you know, and this again is about approaching, um, iteration and incubation. If you think about 3D printing as being an incredible uh, opportunity to 
you know, rapid prototype, we're very familiar with that. Even with the most humble 3D printer, we can kind of get our ideas out, even if they're not 100% there. And it's about, you know, rapid iter iterations and rapid prototyping so that we have not one idea to consider that could scale, but 100. And so, yeah, just take that philosophy with you when we think about technologies like 3D printing and we might have a chance of getting to 100 million. <laughs> well, while 100 million seems like initially when you first hear the number, a daunting goal or a challenge, when you're in speaking with these governments, the, you know, the Indian government governing all their education of maybe there's 45, I don't know, I think you mentioned maybe 45 million students impacted there. Or maybe, maybe that was that was China, I think. That China, <laughs> that's just middle. Oh, that's, yeah, just middle way, that's just middle. That's just middle school. Just middle school, China. right? I mean, <laughs> India and China; these are really big. So you should hit your goal fast countries. there. <laughs> but they're, they're, well, well, yeah, I was thinking that's the thing. That but you, the you challenge have those is education systems in those big countries. You probably yeah. will hit the goal. But I, I, met, I can also see that we know from experience in China, at least. I, I can't say I have any experience with India, but how they teach things like math in China is very different than we're used to in the US at least. I don't know how it is in Australia, but I mean, they look at a number like a thousand and it's not really a thousand, it is 10 one hundreds, right? I mean, they, they have different ways that they look at math and teach math. So I imagine that presents some interesting challenges for you. But I think it also though goes to tying into the, you know, the factors you were talking about to creating these soft skills of critical thinking and collaboration and all of those things. That's what we found is that certain countries who are really great at teaching math and teaching science and, and the true STEM by not having a little bit of that art and that sort of more abstract thinking in their approach fails to create to put people who can actually be creative and critical thinking in applying towards innovation and, and things that we, we actually will need even more when more of our AI is crunching our data for us, right? Yeah, for sure. And, and I think, you know, it, it's, it, education as a field's fascinating because uh, a lot of what's old is new again. <laughs> so when we talk about this uh, focus on immersive learning, that is, you know, project-based or immersive learning, experiential learning. You've got folk like John Dewey who conducted those experiments, I, I think about a hundred years ago and found that, hey, look, somehow, if you allow more sensors to be involved in your learning process, humans seem to do a better job of it, right? So um, we have it's Montessori, just that, that that's the same model, right? Sure, sure. So what we're learning uh, even about our brains and how we learn, is kind of like we've we've discovered the earth isn't flat anymore and i, sp I spoke to a um, neuroscientist about you know this this field of understanding human learning from a neuroscience perspective and uh, it's a really interesting time that, that we're in but it's confirming a lot of things which is um, if you take the most simplest one is that people learn differently in different ways and that uh, i guess our, our brains and how they're equipped to learn the next thing that we're talking about or looking at is sort of more like a, a, a musical symphony that's been going on for however long you've lived. And at that moment, you're inserting the music. Um, and that's how we learn. It's sort of, you know, uh, a cup means something to your mind based on all of the exposure to concepts and memories and negative or otherwise. And so it's a really, really complex thing, but I suppose what we're looking at is how do we offer learners um, a variety of different modes or ways of learning something, again, grounded on something they care about or that matters either to them, to the world, you know, technology is allowing that to be possible at scale because the reason we have a, a lot of set format in education is to deliver scale. So we've been really fortunate in the world, particularly developing countries, where uh, maybe a couple of hundred years ago, we were able to produce a scalable education system that for the most part tried to deliver to as many people as possible. I think um, that's the challenge though of the developed countries, like here in the US, for instance, everything in our education process is so fractured. 
we mentioned sort of like the controls over the school districts and, you know, it's sure. not, and, you know, and sometimes the state levels. So like New York state has a mm-hmm. higher control. California has different sets. So, you know, you look at that and that fracture frustrates families and parents and, and, you know, we get through the system. And so that's where I think in the 3d print industry, we've seen this sort of like really proactive, like grassroots program to like bring it into the schools and or supplement it out so that it was accessible. And that's why we had a lot of maker spaces and a lot of those popping up to make it happen because it wasn't going to happen fast through the other system and then force everybody to go like, we better catch up. So then the school district would comply. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So research is really important in these areas because remember, you know, the education system that we have and you know, we can feel very fortunate in developed countries where that's making a big difference, has done for years, has kind of been from maybe 100 or so years ago and th- those overarching structures. So so there's limitations that are there and maybe you've, we've hit the limits of those. And look again, come back to community context. So if you think about individual towns, cities, suburbs, there's different things going on there that um, if you think about it from a human capital perspective, it's imagining how could we take all the skills and knowledge and ability of different folk in this area, perhaps globally as well now, and apply it to the unique problems that we have. You know, the sorts of problems, I'm sure where you guys live, if you move three suburbs over, there could be some different things that are going on there. Uh, this is the same in every community on earth. So this is where if if folk like us are, uh, who kind of know a thing or two about technology are sort of firstly coming to the conversation about so what is firstly the the problems we're seeing and then how do we think about from our perspective those problems in terms of stuff that we can now do which is constantly changing so there's new opportunities coming up maybe to resolve these problems is really defining them first having some consensus about this would be great to solve and then moving from that to is there an opportunity for a technology that we have today to play a role to help that at scale? Let's go test it. Uh, Then it might be that we don't have yet the answer in technology, but that gives companies like HP and others uh, an opportunity to go figure out and research it and maybe create it, right? So, So this is kind of a way we can all approach the challenges in education. But hey, there are also opportunities, right? You know, once we start thinking about 3D printing, uh, coming back to that topic, uh, it's it's really amazing what it could be doing from an education perspective at scale and what's possible we need to research. So, you know, again, at, at a higher education level, um, the conversations, if I put them in two categories, are what does it offer in terms of research? Because universities do and have always done an amazing job of contributing very valuable research on pretty much everything. So it's where does it play roles there? And then the other one is how does it transform teaching and learning? Uh, Specifically, we obviously need to train people in additive manufacturing. That's a new thing and it's going to create enormous amounts of jobs. But what about transforming every kind of learning? You know, so if I'm studying philosophy, is there a role for 3D printing in philosophy? And, and, you know, because we maybe want people to, to learn it better. You know, or, that really ties right to the episode where we were interviewing Cindy Schultz in, in the middle school. And that's what she was looking at. And she was like, can I teach 3D print in the context of teaching a history, a social studies assignment? Can I teach it in with my English assignment? And that's what she started to look at and do that she found very successful and that other mm-hmm. teachers in her community wanted to model was that she found that by applying the lesson that was there, and then just having 3D print become a tool within that it started to share the technology at the same time to understand the application and use of it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, 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 you know, uh, I mentioned before um, the project in China and other places. So, and it really was investigation. So research is the foundation. It's, it's taking these technologies and they're very disruptive and then carefully considering where does it actually make any kind of difference in learning outcome Um, And holding it kind of loosely, sometimes there's a lot of pressure on education, educators, both at tertiary and and secondary and primary levels, that they should be engaging in tech uh, for the sake of the fact that it's out there. It's dangerous. Uh, But instead, what we could be doing is saying, I don't know, uh, you know, what are we having struggles with? Um, 
let's investigate to see if this actually is of any use at all, where it could be. So um, if I ask the two of you, I've got a question for the two of you. So think about when you're at school, could be university uh, in this case or, or grade school. What, what are subjects that you would describe as really non-immersive, non-experiential, uh, well, maybe a word, yeah. boring? Well, Tom and I so went to the same college. So, so yeah, okay. so we both went to Rhode Island School of Design. And I would say that our, our probably our least immersive one would have been art history because there was an occasional <laughs> dozing off in that class. So uh, that would happen right. very commonly, well, I right? Think, I would think history in general, where you're yes. reading about history, whether you're okay. in you know, primary school or secondary. Yeah, you know, memorize you, a bunch of da facts. You can't yeah. experience it as well <laughs> as you okay. can science experiments let's say or or art classes or maybe even math that you're you're performing you know you're you're calculating things to come up with solutions so that, yeah, that's and, what and I, and I think say. english literature there's always plays so there's like vocalization of things so that that's a more immersive too know. but yeah. you're right history is like the one that i think and with it, yeah that we kind of hit into yeah i gotcha so it, it's it, it's interesting because we um recently so we did sort of campus of the future research around um, immersive technologies. And so for HP, that includes extended, you know, extended reality, which has 3D printing. And it was really given, sort of giving the question to, so we've done two bodies of this research. And uh, so we gave the initial question about, hey, what, what is this useful for extended reality and immersive technologies? And so we have, I think about 21 uh, mostly R1 universities across the world in the US and they went and looked at this stuff and we coordinated the the, the output of it through Educause and they published it and the first findings were well here's a bunch of areas where they take something like I don't know art history <laughs> and they engage more of your senses and so it has this benefit but it also did this bit where it looked at the level of immersion did it really make a difference and was it harder to do it than maybe something else. And so again, it's, it was looking about the form and function of uh, say 3D printing, which was included around these questions of can, can we understand whether it has an outcome? We followed up um, after we found a bunch of areas to go investigate, followed up with the second body of research, Campus of, Refu Campus of the Future Research, which then looked at teaching and learning more discreetly to sort of say, what are the opportunities around those two areas where it really helps? So some of it, it's kind of obvious, right? So you talk about art history and imagine if, you know, you can engage something which might be a little bit more motivational than reading a book. So what we're going to create is an artifact from art history that you're going to create and, or, or, or anything that or walking can, around a sculpture, right? You know, like, you yeah, yeah. Sure. I mean, I think it that's could... the difference is like when you get to walk into it and you get to see it and that's where XR could be fantastic to bring that so many places. It, it, exactly. And, you, you know, you start to get to use some of the things that you love about expressing your art, because if we give you the opportunity to express a, an artistic thought in the context of your history, or if the teacher's handing out objects which relate to art history, you know, or we're giving you an immersive experience. So you might put a VR headset on and walk through some of the things, the galleries that they're talking about in the book that you don't get to see. We know that this has a profound effect on people. Now, the secret source is finding out what scales. Remember, it might not be practical to take 30 people or 100 people in a lecture theatre and strap a headset to them all at once. Uh, so, so, of course, we, we want to be really hard nosed in some ways around saying, well, if we could find a way to do this, could we share it with everyone everywhere in the world? And that's HP's focus and the, the research that we do in our team around these educational questions. Um, so, so to get 100 million again, it's about saying, well, what's, what's universally applicable or applicable in, in, in pretty big situations? So again, uh, well, we've established as well through um, uh, Rady's Ch Children's Hospital, we worked with them with the, our 3D printers, for example, on because uh, it's a children paediatric sort of facility. And so looking at um, surgery. And so they're using, for example, the abilities we already have to scan organs uh, to prepare for surgery. So we'll get all this imaging. But what we discovered with them is that, you know, if the surgeons have the opportunity to literally look at that little baby's heart, the heart of that little baby because there's 
differences in symmetry with different humans, um, obviously differences in size and scale. And if there's trauma, that trauma will be unique to person, to people. So they've, they've created a, a very fundamental link between being able to create these models to prepare for surgery and, you know, a much higher level of confidence with the surgeons. Believe it or not, I mean, surgeons are pretty confident people. Let's face it, they have to be. Uh, but you can imagine how in, in important it is to build on that if you can so that they have this this sense that they really know how to plan and go in and do this work so Visualize so they, it, they right it makes great. it yeah, you know, it, yeah. It expresses that visualization you know exactly. you, you were talking earlier about um educational development factors and some things that you know i think are fundamental to you know what's going to make a more immersive t uh, education and going to make this more successful to get you know, improve learning outcomes because that's what uh, our obvious goal. Do you have some that that are guiding principles and sort of that when you're always analyzing what's going on in um, and advising in one of these school districts or these industries or these governments? Are you looking at sort of like certain factors within that? Yeah. So um, at a macro level, at a high level, HP embarks on this on we have sort of an approach um, it's called NETA so National Education Technology Assessment and that takes us through a whole bunch of um, community surveys and it's kind of leveraging a whole bunch of data 100 years from different sources um, so we, we recently did one of these uh, at, in Idaho actually the state of Idaho so and it involved enormous numbers of surveys and, and talking to people talking to different communities so that we could look at the human capital sort of development opportunities for that state and then maybe provide some input um, on uh, where there were opportunities for the state to maybe look at legislature, look at different ideas in terms of shaping the way they can do their education, you know, finding opportunities for them. So that's an example of something that we do. It's kind of a formal process. And what was really cool actually was um, we, we uncovered this opportunity for social and emotional education because you know the commu communities uh, can can have a lot of challenges around um, these sorts of areas, and we talk about that in the education community a lot globally. Is this social emotional intelligence and how it plays a role to give people these very highly adaptive skills in the workplace and resilience? Um, so, what was really encouraging I heard recently is that the governor there um, supporting some policy and funding to actually put into social and emotional learning. So it's nice to be HP and uh, work with Brookings Institute in this case, uh, sometimes with UNESCO and, and provide a, a whole group of communities, a state in the United States where they have this opportunity. But we've done similar things in countries like Rwanda. So if you have a look at Rwanda now, most people remember that country as a place that was war torn and Black Hawk Down as the kind of movie that set the tone. But, but if you have a look at it today, it's from where it's come from. It's just an amazing place. And we were fortunate uh, some years back to do an edit with them around their education system. And, and so it, it's, it's, as you said, you know, there, there's, there is actually a way we do this. Now, in a higher education context, it's about team members like ourselves sitting down with the universities. Um, this campus of the future research that we're doing and, and the concept of it is one that we're really uh, love to engage higher education institutions in so that we can look at, once again, different universities delivering different kinds of areas of special edu you know, education areas that they're specifically good at, and then giving them some encouragement around uh, reshaping some of that um, education to uh, better equipped better equip people for um, the fourth industrial revolution and, and the change in society that we want. And but what you that know, looks it's, like. It's occurring to me that the campus of the future also really needs to include a better, I'm going to call it alumni engagement into lifelong learning. Like, you know, I feel like they reach out yeah. to us all the time and ask us for money, but they don't ask us if, if, they, if we want continuing education, if we want to learn something new, if, you know, and yeah. that I think is really an opportunity, especially when you can do virtual learning because we're all over the world now. We're no longer in the same town we, you know, went yeah. to college in. So, exactly. you know, exactly. I think that's a, that's a shame that we don't have that yet. So that sounds like the okay. campus of the future needs to have that. <laughs> sure, sure. Okay. Okay, see, and that's that's the concept, isn't it? It's not the it's not the four walls of the lecture theatre or yeah. the campus itself, isn't it? It's a bit of we've got these two terms: classroom of the future, campus of the future, and it's a bit tongue in cheek because it, it 
doesn't really mean the campus as we think of it traditionally. And it doesn't really mean the four walls of a classroom. What it does mean, it, it, it's about thinking about, uh, I, I like to say, places, spaces and people. So if I thought about uh, you two in the context of Campus of the Future and your alumni. So you're engaged in this really amazing area of 3D printing and you've got a passion for it. You're, you're super on the pulse um, talking to people like me and much smarter people. And, and so you have enormous amounts of uh, you know, resource to offer uh, to help keep universities on the pulse. So how do we take the people people like yourself and actually even the extended community you're connected to and meaningfully at scale connect that into the institution in which you're an alumni and what is it that you help them address in terms of their challenge and because you're in 3D printing um, I kind of have an idea about that so the first part is that obviously we need a bunch of people who understand additive manufacturing you understand this really well so you can encourage them to pursue development of their curricula around that. And you also kind of know what, you know, taking people who've got an interest in, you know, additive manufacturing, what, you know, the best way to engage those people, because you're talking about a whole range of different learners. You know, some of them are grandmas, grandpas, you know, who are taking up 3D, right? Well, so you're, really, think about you're really talking about breaking down, again, that wall that we were just talking about, that traditional wall, because sure. there is a wall, and there's a very strict wall, a lot of times, at least here in the US, between our university system and our, our corporations and our, our yeah. business, our people who are entrepreneurs and not professors, right? And so we have that, that very clear, distinctive wall, and that's why there has always been this sort of, I'm going to call it a, a struggle in communication, which is like, you're not putting out the right kind of employees that I need, and, and we're bringing you great people, and you're yeah. not hiring them, like, you know, like, and it's this conversation back and forth, but that collaboration needs to start to happen. That wall needs to mm -hmm. break down in order for the curriculum to get better, for us mm -hmm. to be able to have great workers as we go forward and be able to hit the ground running and have that cycle back into more money into the schools again. So, yep. Yep. so and, and look, um, I would say on large, the community, the, the higher education community, universities as a community, of, you'll hear it a lot. They're, they're very much all about how do we engage industry more in undergraduate courses, not just postgraduate research. Um, so, so they really do want to do this. And it's about an exciting opportunity we're all sitting on to help them. And so part of that is, is literally thinking about those problems you mentioned, you know, which is we have skill shortages in a whole bunch of areas. Um, yeah, like um, one of the both in technical and non-technical traditional areas. So as our populations age and at HP talk about megatrends a lot. So a lot of countries, we've got an aging demographic and it's changing. So what that means is there's enormous amounts of pressure on healthcare. So uh, we talked about Radies Children Hos Children's Hospital before. Um, we can talk about aged care as well. So immersive technology is helping them deliver a lot more healthcare, a lot quicker and a lot more effectively because that's what society is going to need. Um, so when we think about universities, every country in the world, in fact, faces this problem. We can't train medical practitioners fast enough. There's not enough of them to give treatment to everyone, right? Just in a nutshell. I mean, we know this. Well, we gaps, have nursing right? so, shortages here as well. So uh -huh, yeah, so uh -huh. that's a very good example. There you go. So, so it, you know, we think about how long it takes to train someone in the proficient skills and knowledge that's required to become a doctor or a nurse. So one of the things is if we could accelerate uh, whilst not losing any quality, the learning and skill development, if you could accelerate it, the world would be profoundly changed if you could take even one month or one year off that, off that um, time to train uh, because we can then meet the needs. Now, as I said, aging demographics also means that we won't have enough, um, let's say young middle-aged people um, as highly skilled surgeons to perform the knee surgeries we're all going to need when we're like 90 and still kicking around. <laughs> so right? We're going to need that. Yeah. So they better hurry sure. up. Right? <laughs> exactly. But, but, but this is just an example of many of the areas, which that's, that's just what society is now living in good for good reasons. You know, we live longer. We're, we're very lucky um, uh, to, to be able to do that in developing countries. Um, 
But whatever the problem looks like, I think there's this great opportunity for us to really huddle around higher education, work with them. Um, there's a, a willingness to do this. And if, you, if I think about the company I work for, HP, it's 80 plus years old now. Um, it had its birthplace um, on campus, right? Two guys, you know, uh, university students and part of our facility is still on campus um, at, at that university. But so it, it is a great, it's historically a great place for, for things to start, but we do need it to ramp up a lot more. So again, I come back to 3D printing. And uh, as I said, the thing about it is we want to have conversations and encouragement for higher education to um, jump on board industry. I mean, like HP, as an example, if you can imagine, we are um, eating our own dog food, if you like, in terms of the belief in 3D manufacturing, because even our own 3D printers have at least 100 something parts that are made by other three, the 3D printers. So um, believe me, we want this to happen as a manufacturer because of incredible logistic savings that we'll get, incredible sustainability outcomes that we get from that. And of course, it's disruptive, but it's it's really quite simple. It's, you know, if we've got more talent coming in to fill the pipeline uh, with great ideas, exposed and stimulated by the possibility of technology, and that's what 3D is all about in immersive tech, is this, like, um, it isn't just about making at a manufacturing level, it's about why you're even doing it. It's about, if I do it, what can come from that for a higher education institution? It's, well, I can engage accelerated learning and accelerated research. So my undergraduates are grasping concepts like art history. <laughs> you know, they're not dying a thousand deaths there. If it's art history, it could be, you know, creating models around any kind of non-immersive topic. Um, could be theoretical physics needs a bit of a kick in the butt. So you might start to build models that visualize that because um, there's going to be a whole bunch of uh, amazing physicists who might need, who, who might need visualizations to, to grasp a concept and they're going to go off and do crazy stuff for us. Um, you know, well, you space know, exploration. I, 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 I love where you guys have been going with this and this is really interesting and in how you're really, really researching around the world. I think the last question that comes up in my mind that I really just want to make sure that we, we cover here before we end is that, you know, so you've got this improving learning outcomes for 100 million by 2025, but then how are you going to measure that? What, you know, how are you going to measure that outcome um, and that, that learning growth? Okay. Yeah. So, so, so once again, there's, there's a short term uh, way of doing this and there's a long-term way of doing this. The The good news is that there's probably great consensus on kind of what outcomes are in both cases. So in the case of longer term, you know, the human capital development, it's the prosperity of communities. Um, and it's a good idea to sit down and figure out what that is, you know. Um, so in the case of um, the NEDA we did in Idaho, it's looking at all of these different factors socially around, um, you know, uh, rates of criminality or um, poverty or, um, you know, pick any one of the 17. We're going to look really broader. We're not just going to look at grade point averages or anything like that. We're going to look really broader no, at to how the sure. community is growing. That's great. What, what does it mean? To, yeah. And look, it's, you know, we're starting to really look at the, what does it mean to be a citizen? you know, of the world, right, of your community to have uh, not just your rights, but to be able to engage in prosperity, engage in fair work, engage in, you know, quality of life that's, that's about access, right? So, so we could, we could define that. And I think that's, that's at, at the big scale, it's about saying, well, if we looked at the STGs, the sustainability development goals, um, there's some metrics in that, that, uh, 192 nations, in, including nations like North Korea, <laughs> have sort of signed up to. It's the first time in history. Yeah. Um, yeah, and and before that, we had the Millennium Goals. And so one of the goals from the Millennium Goals was, if you thought of educational poverty, we, we basically got to reduce that by 50% in the space of the 15 years. 
uh, that they went on for. So that was from 2000 to 2015, globally reduced poverty by almost half and, and ditto for access to education. If we can do something similar in the next 15 years, that'd be wonderful. So again, measuring outcomes, it can be in those very blunt ways, but we can also refine it a lot to, to not just say, well, I've got access to education, but what good did it do me? Did I get a job? Am I, uh, you know, do I have freedoms? Um, am I able to start to change what freedom looks like in my community or, or, or my country? Because we hope that's what education does. It sort of helps equip people, not just to be better selves, but, you know, create better communities and the world, right? So we've got these goals. Um, let's not forget that, you know, some projections say we need two and a half Earth's worth of resources by 2030. Uh, apparently we don't have, we haven't got into 3D printing Earths yet. Uh, so unfortunately, <laughs> that's going to be a bit of an issue, right? So, so we've got real world problems that affect all of us on this spaceship we call Earth hurtling at thousands of kilometres an hour around the sun. We're all in the boat together. Uh, so we've got to fix the boat to make sure it doesn't sink. Uh, so... So we can certainly think about how education is playing a role to equip people to do that by seeing whether it's working. Um, and then down at the classroom level or at the lecture theatre level, it's about, you know, looking, like, looking at things like, um, you know, the students themselves and their levels of, of engagement, uh, attainment, and then, you know, even industries sort of coming alongside and validating what's being learnt. Um, for two reasons. One, so the university knows they're on track. But the second piece is if we, if an industry is there and the students are around that, then the student gets a chance to understand what it's like in the real world of work, don't they? They get to understand, again, coming back to that point about why am I learning? <laughs> they, can, they can conceive of what they can do in society. Um, they can learn based on things that are happening now, real world things more so. But this is this is the opportunity. So we kind of can talk about these outcomes being, I've got a whole bunch of learners super engaged and they're actually doing real world learning. That means they might be literally solving problems of pollution, literally uh, helping to solve engineering design challenges that a company like mine might have. Like we give, this is happening now, laundry list of issues. Students go, well, we, our guys haven't figured it out. You have a crack. And of course, if they can demonstrate they got some good ideas. Uh, what a wonderful thing to put on your resume uh, because you literally helped, not virtually or theoretically helped a company that you know may or may not exist. You, you helped the real one. So this is important. And so we want to measure those things. Yes, of course. And you said earlier, grade point averages, stuff, stuff like that. Um, there's a reason we had them. It's because we needed education to scale. We needed to justify our taxpayers' money, if that's what was funding it, or our parents' money. We need to do that. Um, and it had limits, or it's had limits, like grade point was it. it was, it's just been a limit that we've had to scale um, because we haven't had the opportunity for technology, uh, different ways of working to engage. Uh, industry involvement has always been in higher education, but limited because uh, if you want a, someone like me to spend a day talking to a university, I've got to travel there. I can only do a few universities in a year. We live in a different world now. We, it's possible to scale one idea and one person to thousands, tens of thousands of people. So let's apply that and change the outcomes that we want, be a bit more ambitious. I love that. Wow, that's fantastic. <laughs> well, you know what, David, I can't think of a, a better way to, to for that to, you know, be really the, the end to this interview. Uh, very well said. And thank you very much for your time and, and coming on and sharing your thoughts with us today. Absolute pleasure. Um, I look forward to, uh, you know, actually uh, listening to and, and watching more of your content. I've spent hours... <laughs> You know, Tracy, I enjoyed that interview, like I said, more than I thought I would. But And it was not, not to be disrespectful to David because, I mean, he's certainly incredibly knowledgeable about his subject. I actually think we're quite fortunate that due to the global pandemic, he actually was in one place long enough at, at home in Australia that we could get a good interview with him well, that's when he's the, not distracted by an event or a university or giving a lecture, you know? Yeah, so that's the kind of funny part about as we've done this series, like we've jumped around a lot based on people's schedules 
angels and other ones. So his was the last one, one of the last ones plugged in. We had two that were on this later side. And so when the last one's plugged in, and the funny part is, is that he mentioned so many things of all these episodes that are to come and episodes that have already happened. And he didn't even know it. He hasn't heard them because none of them have aired yet. <laughs> well, it shows that he has a good grasp of, you know, the 3D, how 3D printing is affecting, you know, global education, manufacturing, uh, sustainability, all, the all whole ecosystem, right? Yeah. Now, you know, it's interesting because I have um, a good friend who's in secondary school education in Connecticut. And, you know, they're using 3D printing and able to have like, you know, a dinosaur bone that is from somewhere on a dig that they have a scan of and they can print it. And then students in the classroom can actually see and experience it. And I think it's things like that, that, it, you know, maybe on a more obvious level, things like that, though, that present this great opportunity of this global classroom. You don't have to actually transport this fragile fossil from one part of the country to another everybody around the world can experience it and as he was talking as david was talking i was thinking about potential applications and thinking about a place that very few of us ever get to go like stonehenge it's some place i'd like to go and see you know based on my education and part of our art history and all sorts of things that we learned and um you know i don't know when i'll get a chance to go there but it would seem that you know if somebody actually scanned or digitized stonehenge there I'm very sure they already have. They probably have. There'd be an <laughs> opportunity to at least 3D print a scale model of that and then well, be able to understand the experience. Drop it into it. XR and there we go. We can virtual well, then, reality walk around it because that, that episode's coming up. So we're going to get to hear some more about that. I know. I, I think there's so many exciting things. I What I really think is that there's so much of, because we're very technology immersed here, right? And we're very 3D print immersed here. So we have a broader possibility as parents and as you know, community members of seeing the possibilities and the opportunities. So those of us, including all your listeners out there and all the people at HP, we are privileged to be able to have this much technology understanding. And when we think about that, we really, all of us do see those faults and those system breakdowns in our education system, whether it's at the primary school level, all the way up to the higher education. So. 3D print education itself, we've been talking about that on and off over our entire almost 600 episodes of, of you know, this podcast where we've been talking about these different things and, and how big a struggle it is. And, and it's not just a 3D print struggle. It's that every time there's some technology to integrate, whether it's data science or AI, or you've got to go through this like painful process of integrating it into our educational system. But what if that system was technology like open, right? And what if that campus of the future and that classroom of the future that David was talking about has the plug-in possibility for us to just tap in the experts everywhere, not wait until our professors and our labs are filled with the technology and equipment. They, they get to just access it when it's when it's there and there's someone capable of talking about it. Yeah, you can't wait. And actually that's one of the great things I think that's happened in the 3D printing industry overall is that I don't think that people have waited. Even no. initially, <laughs> teachers, like remember Cindy Schultz, who at first didn't really want to be bothered with 3D printing, didn't want to have to try to figure out a curriculum. She was sort of forced into it. And then she saw the opportunities and became one of the biggest advocates for it, right? Um, right. Or we but, have classrooms that we have in the Midwest. And we had some of our teachers from Ohio came on the show. And, you know, we're talking about that. So, you know, it's a, it's a broad problem of looking at, at how the integration happens. It is a broad problem. And, and I, I also, what also came to me as we're talking with David is, is about some of what we did, remember, with our mentorship uh, winner, Kalechi, in Africa, and how, you know, 3D printers were being put in Africa. And, and there, it, it really started to make the world smaller David. in terms of, you know, moving business forward, education forward, society forward, and having 3D printing play a role in that. And uh, that was really excited and exciting. And I'm glad we, you know, played a small part in, in trying to make this Try world a little smaller right. in that way. Well, but HP, boy, with their resources, they're doing some amazing well, things. And 100 this is million what, people. Yeah, this or, is what yeah. you didn't hear on the show because he was mm. telling us that after the fact. But his team is 25 plus people. 
So this education team that, there are, that he's a part of is big and it's all over the world. And so whether it's working in the countries, um, working with the governments, or it's on the grounds, putting out the initiatives, doing the research, doing the, the NETA studies, you know, doing the, the legwork of what's needed to be done, they have a big team they can deploy against that. And when he was mentioning how great it is to be able to like talk with us here and, and have the, and be able to do that because he's normally on a plane, you know, this is, we get this sense of how important important it really is for a company with resources to be able to do that because the universities or the school districts aren't necessarily going to be able to fly someone to start talking about it and we can now virtually come in and do that so let's get that classroom of the future and that 3d print education amped up to that next level because i think the rest of us are all have been saying that for a while and we're all ready for it absolutely well exciting stuff yeah and we've got such great episodes coming up we've got a lot more lessons learned and a bunch of other things that are going on in this in this series so you don't want to miss it you can check out the series at hp at 3d start point forward slash hp so you can check out the whole series that is uh, sponsored by hp here and if you missed some of the last one and you're just catching this one because the word education caught your eye make sure because there's going to be six prior to this one so you're going to want to catch those as well so thanks everyone for listening and don't forget the blog post and um, there's uh, resources and all kinds of things that HP has given to us and David has provided. They're going to be in the blog post for this episode at 3dstartpoint.com. All right, everyone. Well, thanks so much. Hope you enjoyed this one and stay tuned. There'll be another coming very shortly. This has been Tom and Tracy on the WTFFF 3D Printing Podcast. Thanks for listening to the WTFFF special series brought to you by the Z and 3D print teams from HP. You can access all the resources mentioned in this episode and all the other episodes in this series by going to 3dstartpoint.com slash HP. We invite you to reach out to us on social at 3D Startpoint and at Z by HP and let us know what you are creating in 3D. 